Okay, so um, so as conversations around AI in K-12 continue to increase and mature, uh, we hear about things like personalized learning and AI tutors, real-time feedback, design, automation, uh, predicting average students, but but what does this re you know really mean for um, you know K twelve practitioners? So this this panel here is is an uh, opportunity for us to explore some of the opportunities and challenges for training uh, pre service and in service K twelve educators about AI in the classroom. So what we hope is as attendees that you'll have the opportunity to to learn about some recent and current AI projects with teachers and students as well as um get some uh, resources uh, for those wanting to move um, into those spaces. Um, so we have uh, a couple different things that we're going to do. Um, first, we are um, going to uh, have some five minute presentations here at the very beginning. Um, and then we will move into a panel's Q&A session and then we'll have an opportunity at the end, you know, 10 to 15 minutes or so to be able to ask any questions. So again, if you can put those in Cuba, that would be appreciated. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sylvia and Marcus. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Looks great. OK. Thank you. So we would like to thank um, Justin Dellinger for inviting us to be part of this panel. My name is Ilya Celedon Patijis, and I'm a professor of bilingual and mathematics education at the University of Texas at Austin. And Marios? And I'm uh, Marios Patijis. I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of New Mexico. And, and we're married, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so the project that we will be presenting on uh, is funded by an NSF test award, two awards. Um, then the, the first, the one that we will be focusing on today is advancing out of school learning in mathematics and engineering, opportunities and challenges in preparing middle school teachers for AI. Um, and what we know that computer programming is rarely taught in middle schools. Our context, um, the work that we did was in urban and Title I rural schools. That meant that there were large numbers of, uh, of bilingual students, in our case, on free and reduced lunch. Uh, most of these students were Latinx. And as you can see, the images show some of the kids presenting their final projects um, in the springtime to their parents, um, their teachers, their friends. And on the left, you see an image of an undergraduate student at the University of New Mexico in engineering. And the student on the right is a middle school student who was co-facilitating um, the learning of the um, integrated curriculum in mathematics and computer programming. Um, in working with teachers and students, um, teachers and students wanted to work with robots. This interest led to an additional level three of the curriculum. That was not something that we had proposed to NSF, but it was it was a level one and level two that we did, and then adding the level three. Um, the teachers and co-facilitators had the opportunity to co-design lessons collaboratively with the research team and explore different mathematics and computer programming concepts. Um, the teachers and co-facilitators provided feedback on both levels of the curriculum. And these components of our model were key to advancing the work in AI. Marius? So a project overview here. Uh, so as we said, we had the middle school teachers co-design lessons to advance with the students' understanding of mathematics uh, through computer programming using Python. So um, after some testing, we we were uh, uh, we had the teachers and the students. Actually, the students are alone build the robots and program them to navigate towards different objects. And also, they had the, the classic escape and maze uh, project. Um, so originally, so these are the three levels. <clears throat> Eventually, level two and three combined. So start with the Raspberry Pi, the components, introduce fundamentals of Python programming. Then we went into binary hexadecimal numbers, uh, image and video representations, and the students built a video at the end, demonstrate uh, their understanding 
uh, of the level one, level two, when into object or in the programming, geometric image transformations, and we cover the traveling salesperson problem as a classic computer science way to understand some of the difficulty. And then the video project that included uh, all of the ideas from TSP. Now the AI came in, in level three, the kids built their own robots in, on day one. Then we taught them about basic middle school mathematics and color histograms. And then they wrote the code for doing collision avoidance uh, using the sensors on their robots and they were allowed to do, then they were asked to do autonomous robot navigation towards color objects. And they did a final uh, robot project that combined some of those previous concepts. So you can hit play. So here is the, you see the robot, it has a video camera. Uh, it sees uh, Mario over there. Uh, it There's to one more battery. The uh, they were experimenting, not they were experimenting about the battery. Uh, so you can see that it's turning, eventually it sees Super Mario and runs over. So that's a, you know, kind of an example of where it worked. And, um, and let's just keep going. The next slide. Um, so it took quite a bit. I mean, obviously we had to, we work with the teachers. They need to learn, they need to learn how to program in Python. And then of course there was uh, our focus throughout all our projects. We looked at the statistics teaching uh, to understand histograms. And then we tied it with color representations. Um, and then, of course, there was a lot of experimentation. You saw an example that worked, but you can imagine we program the robot, you let it down, and, and it's supposed to find the object. Um, we have since moved to Google Colab. Uh, uh, Sylvia, um, next slide. And then um, over here, we have actually provided essentially uh, with internet access, these three links should work for you. You can download it and run three of the main activities on level three. Next slide. And uh, for example, in this, just play the video. We did essentially the similar code inside Jupyter Notebooks. And you can see that uh, the system is keeping track of the running time. So you can set competitions. Uh, and, and essentially the robot stops when it finds the orange color. So it ended up, I mean, we learned the hard way. <laughs> we ended up, uh, basically creating a, a robot simulation during the pandemic that you see here, right? Uh, next slide. Yeah, um, you can, yeah, you, so thanks so much. And you can contact us at, um, these are our emails. If there's any questions or comments, or you would like to discuss this further, but we know where time is up. So thank you. <laughs> awesome, thanks Mario and Celia. Um, uh, Dave, you're next. Okay, thank you. And uh, you can see my screen. Yes. 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 Okay. So I want to talk briefly about uh, what K twelve teachers need to teach AI. Uh, I'm Dave Turetsky. I'm a research professor in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon. So uh, the first thing I think teachers need, and, and I I learned this from uh, my first conversations with K twelve teachers, is that many of them. Um, don't have a definition of AI. The first thing they ask me is, what is a good definition of AI? So if we want K-12 teachers to be confident teaching it, first thing we need to do is make sure that they can define it. Um, the next thing, I think they need to be familiar with the five big ideas in AI, which have been put together by the AI for K-12 initiative, uh, a, a project that I uh, started uh, and um, it's been funded by NSF, and I'll show you the five big ideas in a second. Um, after this, I think the next thing teachers need is they need to think about how AI appears in their own daily lives. So there are many uses of AI technology that uh, they may not be aware that there's AI there. Uh, for example, there are lots of things on their phone are AI powered, um, their Facebook feed, uh, their Netflix, um, Google search, <coughs> excuse me, all this is AI technology. So we want them to feel that AI is not some exotic foreign thing, but it's actually part of their everyday life. Um, and then we can ask, do they have access to professional development? Um, so 
at some point, if they're going to be teaching AI, um, they need access to a good professional development program that will show them what a good AI curriculum looks like, give them some um, experience experimenting with AI technologies and showing them how this should be taught to students. And I have resources for all this stuff, which I'm going to show you in a moment. And they need good supporting materials, um, online demos that are uh, appropriate to K-12, unplugged activities, videos, and so on. And uh, fortunately, the list of good materials is, is growing every year. So there's, there's lots of good news there. So here's the five big ideas in AI. This was um, put, put out by ai for k 12org back uh, in 2018. Um, and we have a little graphic here explaining the five big ideas. And just briefly, you can see that these ideas are perception, representation and reasoning, learning, natural interaction, and societal impact, which we put in the center of the wheel because it touches on uh, the other four big ideas. We have a poster on the five big ideas that explains these ideas in a little more detail. Um, this was uh, designed for use in, in uh, K-12 classrooms, but I've also find, found it, uh, it's quite useful for explaining AI to congressmen as well um, and other uh, government officials. So this poster is available in 16 languages now, uh, and you can download it from the AI for K-12.org website. Now, um, the main work of ai for k 12org has been trying to define what students should know about AI and what they should be able to do with it. And we followed the example of the CSTA computing standards, uh, which um, the most recent version of that was in 2017, but those computing standards only had two sentences about AI. And so that, that led to the creation of the ai for k 12 initiative because we saw this, uh, this gap um, that the computing standards just weren't addressing AI at all. So uh, we put together uh, a series of grade band progression charts. So for each of the five big ideas, there's a grade band progression chart. And for the four grade bands, K to two, three to five, six to eight, and nine to 12, there are lists of concepts and subconcepts. This is only uh, one page of a larger document. And we're laying out what a good AI curriculum should cover. So what students should be able to do, what they should know and be able to do in each of these four grade bands. So this is not a curriculum itself, but it's, it's a specification for what a curriculum should cover. We also have an online resource directory uh, with links to uh, books, software, videos, curriculum, lots and lots of stuff here. So I encourage you to explore that. And we've just recently uh, put out a set of activity resource guides. So in the grade band progression charts, if you look at some of the cells in these tables, uh, they have activities, but these activities are described in just one or two sentences. And so that's not enough. Uh, it's not enough support for a teacher to actually lead this activity in the classroom. So we've started producing these activity resource guides. So each guide focuses on a single activity and we take the uh, teacher step by step through, uh, this is how you set it up, this is what students will learn by doing this, and then these are the steps that you go through with your students to successfully conduct this activity. So these are also linked from the ai for k 12org website. Uh, there are five of them in the initial release and we have more on the way. Finally, uh, we are developing curriculum now. Uh, we have an NSFI test project called AI for GA, Artificial Intelligence for Georgia. Um, this is a collaboration between uh, me at Carnegie Mellon, Christina Gardner McCune at the University of Florida, and Brian Cox at the Georgia Department of Education. And we're doing two things. We're, we're developing and piloting a nine-week AI elective for middle school students, specifically in Georgia. Uh, we're in um, multiple schools in multiple counties um, in Georgia right now. Um, and the second thing we're doing is we realize that this curriculum will not scale up if I have to personally train the teachers. So we're developing an online teacher PD course uh, that will, will come out sometime um, late 2023 that we hope to use to enable scale up of this curriculum uh, initially statewide in Georgia, but Eventually, we hope uh, to make this available nationally. So uh, that's my uh, overview, and I'll stop here.
Great, thanks, Dave. All right, Helen, you're up. Yep. Can you all see my screen? Yep. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Helen Van. I'm from Boston College. Today, I'm presenting for our project called Everyday AI for Youth. This is a project funded by NSF iTest program and Irene Lee from MIT is the PI of the project. For our project, our overarching goal is to learn how we can prepare middle school teachers to integrate AI lessons into their regular school day classes. The backbone of our project is a curriculum called Developing AI Literacy Curriculum, or Daily Curriculum. Uh, this daily curriculum, uh, we use basically uh, teacher try to teach AI literacy concept through teaching four relevant aspects of AI. Ethics of AI, AI core technical concepts, creativity or creative use of AI, and AI's impact on future careers. And through our implementation of the curriculum with middle school students, we found this curriculum was effective, engaging, and age appropriate for students. So with this curriculum, then our next step is you know, what can we do or how can we bring this into classrooms? And more importantly, which means um, how can we prepare middle school teachers to use this in their classrooms? Uh, as all co my colleagues have been talking about, you know, AI is still pretty new for most of the K-12 educators. And most of them have very limited prior knowledge or experience in terms of teaching AI. So to support them, our, um, our project provided a year-long teacher professional development and it included three major components to support teachers. Specifically, the three components are, firstly, is the AI book club. This is an online PD session where teachers meet every week for about uh, two hours. And these teachers read a book together, they review our daily curriculum, and more importantly, they learn the daily lessons as learners. And then we have facilitator trained to provide the suggestions or teaching um, tips to these teachers. Then after the AI book club, the next component is this summer practicum experience where our teachers actually form the co-teaching teams to teach these daily lessons in our summer camps. And thus the campers are again middle school students and then teachers, each of the teachers are expected to teach eight to nine hours of daily lessons. And at the end of every day, those teachers held a reflection session together to reflect on their teaching experiences and brainstorm how they can potentially make the improve their teaching for the next day. And then to go to the third component is we, are, we offer this uh, monthly webinars and follow-ups during the school year when teachers are really into this kind of implementation of daily curriculum. And this monthly webinars is a chance for teachers to share their implementation experiences and the tips. They also discuss about how they can make changes to the curriculum and pedagogy to make it more culturally responsive to their students. In terms of the research, we're interested in looking at how we can best prepare teachers, what kind of supports are necessary, and more importantly, how do the teachers really enact the curriculum in the curriculum? What kind of modifications did they, they do? What kind of uh, teaching practices were found to be effective? And ultimately, we're also interested in student learning. Yeah. Uh, one major goal of our project is to broaden participation in AI. To achieve this goal, we have been working with three districts in Florida, Virginia, and Illinois. Each of the school districts serve a large percentage of students underrepresented in STEM or computer science education. And even for our summer practicum uh, sites, we also work with youth servant organizations in New York, Boston, and New Mexico. All these youth servant organizations focus on recruiting and engaging students underrepresented in STEM. And I want to say that one challenge for our project is specifically uh, try to recruit teachers of color. We decided to make this choice for multiple reasons. One is because we are serving student population, you know, with a large body of students who are underrepresented in STEM education or computer science education. 
Um, but if you look at the teacher population and teachers of color are actually heavily underrepresented nationally in the teacher profession. In order for us to reach equal representations of people of color in both the student group and teacher group, we need to must make this extra effort to recruit teachers of color. Another reason for our recruitment of working with teachers of color is that you know, research has already found that if uh, a student have a teacher with same race or ethnicity background as the student, this teacher often has more positive impact on the students. And now also minority teachers often they have more positive expectations of uh, minority students. All these reasons makes us decide that we are gonna focus around recruiting teachers of color. Fortunately, now we're in our year two of the project and we have been pretty fortunate to have been so far trained over 30 classroom teachers and among them over 70% of them are teachers of color. And uh, forever, we also have some preliminary findings and we found that definitely students, uh, teachers improved significantly their com content knowledge about AI after the book club. And particularly teachers develop pretty solid understanding about how to identify whether technology may use AI not or not, and also principles of machine learning. We also found the continued growth in teachers' attitudes toward AI and self-efficacy of teaching AI after each PD segment. This is important for us, which basically shows each of the components is necessary for teachers. And finally, we're excited to find that all of our participating teachers managed to find places to integrate AI into their classrooms. These are teachers running from math teachers, science teachers, to English teachers and civics teachers. We're in the process of analyzing data of that. So that's all I have. Thank you. Please feel free to uh, contact us or post your questions in the chat. Thanks, Alan. All right, Uncle, you are last. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for your time and participation today. My name is Dong Song, and I'm an associate professor of Texas A&M University, the College of Engineering, also the managing editor of International Journal of Multiple Research Approaches. As you can see here, I have a very diverse background uh, from religious studies, computer science, and instructional systems technology. Now I am focusing on this AI engineering for human performance and computational analysis of human learning data. I think other panelists are focusing on the like a bigger problem and bigger picture. And let me show you my smaller picture in this short uh, presentation. Uh, long story short, the two types of my research trends is the first one is the AI engineering for human performance or AI engineering for human learning. Uh, the direct interaction between these AI systems and the learner or direct interaction between this AI system and pre-service or in-service teacher, if we can create these systems, I would call it as an AI engineering for human learning or human performance. As opposed to this front-end approach, the back-end approach, the education data mining or learning analytics, the use of AI or computational techniques for analyzing data we collected from K through 12 education context. The first examples of my research for this front-end approach are the use of these AI agents or chatbot or AI virtual agents for education. The context are the online learning support and K through 12 anti-bullying education and pre-service teacher education and online learning and teacher education. These contexts, we can utilize AI agents for the training and learning because in online learning situation, the synchronous interaction is very important and for anti-bullying education, conversational method is important, student teaching for teacher education, interactive scaffolding for pre-service teacher education. 
These are very well-known methods in the research field, educational research field in general. But the issue is that it's very hard to implement these aspects in real-life situation. My idea is to utilize this AI agent in different types of learning context. So the results were the increased online participation, changed the attitude towards peer norms. These are not that huge impact, but still we can utilize this AI agent for education a little bit. For example, the stop bullying, the anti-bullying education. The students were assigned to each of the three groups, like a bully, big team, and teacher. I mean, the agent, that AI chatbot can take a role of bully and the role of victim or role of teacher. So three different groups of students were interacted with these different types of AI agent to increase their anti-bullying perception. So through these types of uh, interaction, they were able to increase their perception of the anti-bullying, how bullying incidents are serious. So with these findings, I am trying to create these metaverse or AR or VR or XR environments to create these AI agents in this environment. So to, we need to inc uh, add some more like a behavior aspects as well as, as long as this chatbot interaction as well. So another type of research is the backend approach. Uh, we can collect the outcome data using different types of survey or exams or tests or any types of uh, teacher and student interaction uh, data. But in this digital environment, digital learning environments, we already collected process-based data like learning management system can collect uh, when they logged in, how long they stayed in the learning management system, that kind of thing. We can utilize the AI for analyzing this K through 12 data as a learning analytics. One of my research was to provide computer programming opportunity for pre-service teachers. And I'd like to know their learning process in this uh, computer programming learning. So the task was the 50 coding tasks and then their participation and how many tasks they were completed and how many trials they did for their testing their codes and then how many successful codes they were created and then coding time were collected through the system and the self-regulation computational thinking skills and their learning performance were analyzed in this research. The first approach is the traditional statistical approach, but it's not that promising. So the results showed a little bit of the relationship between the self-regulation and their selective uh, the tasks. But uh, in this process-based approach, when we use the machine learning techniques for analyzing this huge amount of 50 tasks, 100 preserved teachers data. So the machine learning techniques were able to reveal this relationship between the computational thinking skills and time management pattern. And then final, the learning performance and success pattern were revealed, which, were, could, which couldn't be revealed in the statistical analysis. So it was too brief <laughs> introduction of my research, but I'm happy to discuss about my research and my colleagues' research. And thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Thanks so much for your presentations and uh, at least a brief glimpse into the great work that you all are doing. So um, at this time, we're going to uh, shift to a uh, guided uh, Q&A time, and then we'll go to more open uh, Q&A time. So um, I'm going to take the a moment here to just talk about some of the opportunities and challenges for AI in K-12. I know we kind of um, touched on some of it in some of the presentations here, but I just wanted to open it up if someone want to uh, pick that one to start. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. David, David, go ahead. No, okay. Do you want me to go? Yeah. I'm an outsider. Actually, my, my background is electrical and computer engineering, and uh, I rely a lot on the educational uh, people like my wife and people here on the panel. I have to say that one of the biggest findings is that the students are very hungry for opportunities in programming and what we call, you know, so we find repeatedly 
is that, for example, I didn't want to do robots. I didn't want to do the games, online programming that you saw. All of those things came because uh was completely outside of the original scope of the work. But the kids wanted to learn about AI, and um, I just want to add this. We ended up taking literally our PhD research. Uh, for example, we have a project we recently published a paper over about a million videos that we process with Jupyter Notebooks, Python, video analysis. And we took exactly the same and we tested it, exactly the same framework, uh, same libraries, not exactly the same functions. Obviously we were limited. Uh, and we tested in the classroom and we found incredible response. Everybody was happy and excited. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity. And I want to emphasize one more thing, all the work done by the people on this panel or any work that any teacher will do, which involves AI, is a lot more than what they're getting right now. And they are hungry. And, and even what we see repeatedly, even from our project, is that they go to other projects and they come and tell us about how excited they are, you know, uh, when they see the connections to what all of us are doing here. We stop. So I think uh, one of the challenges is that we're still trying to make our teachers competent computing teachers, right? So, you know, computers were part of the third industrial revolution. We're still trying to catch up with that. And now AI is powering this fourth industrial revolution. And so uh, we're, we're behind, right? I mean, you know, in, in one of Marius' slides, he, he said that computer programming isn't normally taught in middle school. Well, why not, right? I mean, it ought to be in every single middle school. In fact, some places are teaching it in elementary school. Scratch Junior is done in, in kindergarten and first grade. Scratch, they start Scratch in third grade. By the time they get to high school, they should be doing Python. And yet, um, if you go to code.org and look at the statistics on how states are doing in computing education, nobody um, is close to meeting their, their goals of universal computing education. So we're still trying to catch up to this tremendous um, capacity need just to teach computing. And, and uh, sorry, you know, we don't, we don't have time to wait for that because the AI revolution is coming. And we have to play catch up with that as well. So I think that's a huge challenge is getting people up to speed with computing and now getting them up to speed with AI as well. When, when I first gave talks about the AI for K-12 initiative, and we said, we're serious about the K in AI for K-12. We're not, this is not a joke. We're, we're serious about starting in kindergarten. And people were very skeptical. They said, what do you need to teach AI to kindergarten? Why are you introducing AI in kindergarten? And our response was, we're not introducing it. By the time these kids get to kindergarten, they've spent two years talking to Alexa. They grew up with AI, but they don't understand it, right? And so our, our society is changing very rapidly, and we, we have to try and keep up. I wanted to um, agree second with my colleagues. I wanted to share when we sent up the invitation letters or recruitment try to recruit teachers. Initially, we thought most of the teachers responded might ended up be computer science teachers, but it turned out that we have over a half of our teachers were actually teachers, English teachers, library teachers, and civics teachers. This shows that teachers were very hungry. We, when we started, a lot, almost all of our, of our teacher participants said, we heard about AI, but we really wanted to learn about what is it? Because, you know, literally their kids, students were using with social media and all these tools. Teachers definitely recognize the importance of that. Yeah. I also wanted to add it, um, based on our work, we found out one challenge for K-12 teachers, particularly around middle school teachers, to teach AI is um, often teachers found out um, how to say they don't have a good like a learning community. We found out that for our approach, particularly teachers were, um, our teachers have been so engaged was because we think we have fostered a learning community. Uh, um, we found out that, you know, if roughly we have, you know, four dedicated teachers from same school district are all participate in our PD together, they are more likely to implement the full curriculum 
and uh, they were also more likely to continue using the curriculum in the second year. This is what we found in our year two results. Often teachers mention about they found out it's, you know, it's kind of not only lonely, but also they felt that it's good to have some kind of colleagues in the same school district that they can talk to when they are using AI in classrooms. Yeah, I'd like to add a little bit point of this thing. I mean, AI is a very broad term. As David said, we need to define it first. But I felt a little bit about these trends of AI education is learning toward, moving toward a little bit, focusing on the machine learning only and the coding and something like that. So that's why I still be as... Uh, the presentation about the robotics and it can include the vision process or any types of AIs can be taught, but researchers need to focus on the diverse areas of the use of AI rather than focusing on a specific portion of the coding or machine learning techniques. What were some of the, I mean, the actual uh, projects that you were implementing? What were some of the um, concerns that maybe perhaps some of the teachers raised during the process? There's specific ones around understanding data literacy or. Could you rephrase the question or restate it? Just saying, um, so when working with, with K-12 educators, um, pre-service or, or in-service teachers, um, some common concerns that, that came up um, around data literacy, I think is, is the one that I've heard the most, um, being able to understand what kind of data is being collected. Um, I think that's, so what I was curious of, of there been something that bubbled up that's probably been the most common on, on different panels. So data science is, is an, an AI-adjacent topic. It's not really AI. Uh, there's a lot of interest in teaching data science as well in K-12, and there's a lot of industry interest in data science now, uh, in part because data science uh, can feed machine learning. Once you, once you have good data sets, you can use this mach with machine learning algorithms. But data science itself is you know, statistics, it's visualization, it's uh, computer programming. Um, it's not itself actually AI. Uh, so it hasn't come up in, in, in my work, but maybe some of the other panelists can speak to it. And uh, these were not um, concerns, but it was more um, leaving, making sure we leave open up the space for students and teachers to use their own languages. We are working in bilingual settings um, where Spanish and English are being used to make sense of the concepts that, <clears throat> that um, teachers and students were being introduced to. So I think leaving that space to even going between languages with translanguaging, um, those have been all important uh, pieces to the work that we do in, in our own context. To me, the, the greatest challenge that we saw was was that the kids were driving it you know we started by let's say it's kind of funny i mean about 10 years ago when we started working with Sylvia, i was like okay we're going to teach them binary images zero ones right uh and it was became very clear very quickly that the kids wanted to do color video okay so then we were pushed into okay zeros and ones hexadecimals, binary numbers, red, green, blue. Now you got colors. Then we went into NumPy arrays. And, and within, you know, very, very quickly, uh, the kids, like like David said, you know, incredible. In, they've already been exposed to video. They expect, and then they come in day one and they say, I want to program videos. Well, you know, we don't want them to just use their technology. We want to know exactly what's going on down to zeros and ones. So we ended up, building up everything uh, uh, around the kids driving it. So again, for example, I didn't want to do, originally I didn't think that, hey, I, I wanted to do another game programming using Python or, or robots or anything, but then the kids keep pushing it, you know, and then we, we, we will see that, that transformation in the interviews where 
they are hungry for technology. So, so our response to the PD sessions was that the remember this, our students are the co-pilot. So basically the kids picked it up faster than the teachers and the kids taught other kids how to do it faster. And as we demonstrated in the, in the, in the recent publication, they were better at explaining to the kids how this works. Now we did have a little bug up, right? We were watching them. So if, you know, if the computer uh, went bad or the robot, we had a bug up, but it was the, t the, the, the scalability, our attempt at scalability, which wasn't nowhere close to being complete, was that the teachers were the students teaching the students, students to children. And the students that did the teaching were completely transformed. Like in all our measurements, they went through the roof. I mean, they were like, they started for, well, minimal interact. We didn't really trust computing and they became, I don't know, I'll let Sylvia explain that piece. But so the quick answer is students, kids, kids picked it up much faster than the teachers. <laughs> Yeah, no, we saw we saw high increases in the co-facilitators, the middle school kids who took up that role in self-confidence um, and enjoyment for mathematics and and computer programming. Um, but Helen, I also had a question about your um, project because I think um, you said that you were doing the PD sessions throughout the year, and mm -hmm. those were done online, correct? Yes, except so, the summer practicum. Summer practicum depends on where the practicum sites are. Some are online, some are in person. Yeah, okay. but all the others, the webinars, the book club, they are all online. And then does the, did the whole research team meet in one location in the summertime or you support them in different ways? We support them in different ways. Okay. Um, mainly what happened is uh, what we did is that we have this trained facilitators who are local, okay. basically who are more the kind of more experienced teachers from the same school district. Okay. And it's, yeah, literally kind of organized jointly by both the youth servant organization and the facilitators. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks. I also wanted to add a little bit about the data literacy parts. We found out that it's very interesting in our curriculum. You know, we did not specifically address about data set issues, but of course, you know, when you work with AI, particularly machine learning or supervised learning, you've got to deal with data set. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the teachers we're doing. The teacher, um, she's a, a science teacher. So what she did is she actually developed an activity that asked a student to curate data set of pictures so that they can fit into the Google's teachable machine to train supervised models to distinguish between uh, eukaryotic and uh, prokaryotic cells. And students need, literally need to find out di different pictures and then they tested about wh which data set works best and they find out what's the characteristics of the data set that actually works better. I think this is actually a way that we did not specifically address how you can uh, kind of accumulate a more balanced or diverse data set. But this was done by the teacher and also the students. Yeah. Well, what about you? Do you have any thoughts about particular challenges on your end related to the work that you've been doing and you've experienced or that you've seen in the field? Regarding teaching AI to students or the teachers, I have no specific ideas about it, but when we teach them about like a machine learning techniques with the big data or data sets, the data set might be, I mean, biased in some cases, depending on how and when or where we collect the data. So biased data, biased AI in other fields like uh, entertainment, that might be fine. Still, it's a serious issue. But in education, the use of biased data, it's going to be a huge disaster. So we need to find out 
which data set is the biased and how can you monitor the big data? That's another huge research area as well. That's my actual concern. Any panelists have any thoughts about that, about how we look at bias and algorithms and thinking about particularly, I mean, if I'm a, I'm a former K-12 teacher, you know, I'm in a classroom, I taught Spanish and history, uh, eighth grade history, and thinking like, you know, 15 years ago, I was in the classroom, you know, how would I be able to think and know about that and be part of that process? And but just, they don't have researchers to work with. So the bias is real, very well nicely documented by a lot of researchers. We, in our own work, so I do AI, usually biomedical, but now I'm actually doing video analysis on the thousands of hours of videos that we collected, right? That was a little project. And uh, for example, the face detection, detecting people of color in face detection has been shown that it, it's not there. It's, you know, the darker students. We, but, but the quick answer is, uh, of course, you have to be very careful. AI, I think, even though everybody's putting money in it, we talk about day night, it's still not there, okay? The doctors that we work with push, push back a lot. They know they have to do it. Uh, so I don't think it's stable enough, okay? But, but a lot of the problems come from the data sets that are being used. And if you are using a data set of, let's say, only, uh, you know, people looking a certain way, the data set, they will not be able, the AI will not be able to understand what's happening outside that group. But even within that group, you know, I was just doing my final you know, optimization. So we're seeing machine learning. Even if you change it a little bit, it won't understand it sometimes, right? I mean, the stability of the AI systems is still a very hard area of research. So even though there are, I think there are very big ethical issues we had to address transaction misprocessing. A lot of questions that should not be asked, for example, uh, Things like uh, trying to determine race or or beauty or or gender; those are completely unacceptable projects, right? That 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 cannot be done based on, let's say, pictures or anything, right? They, so 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 there is a lot of issues. I think it, we are at the beginning of it, and uh, and I don't think we are ready. And 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 if we're going to go into that, I think uh, you need to be very careful. I can tell you that um, I've been I've seen a lot of controversies. Thank God I was not involved. Let me stop. In our curriculum, we actually have a uh, a major component of the our curriculum is around ethics related issues of AI, and we kind of select and sequence a suite of activities to expose students to different act aspects of this kind of related ethics issues. For example, we started with the um, best PBMJ activity where kids need to think about how to create their best peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then this is where they recognize different people have different views in terms of definition of the best PBMJ. And they, this is actually very difficult for middle school students because they tend to think in their own way, they tend not to think about what other people would think. And then by then, that's almost the, the actually introductory activity for them to recognize different people have different opinions. That means they may have a bias in their created algorithms. And then we also have an activity where kids need to go through um, a bunch of existing technologies like Google's image search, Google's translations, and to find some kind of bias. And afterwards, they discuss about it. And then they discuss about what might cause this bias. And then afterwards, in the machine uh, supervised learning activity, we have uh, activi um, activities where students started using almost a bias data set and see what's the impact, and then think about how they can mitigate the bias. Um, yeah, so overall, I, I agree, as uh, Maria said, there are a lot of uh, issues with the AI technology, and we found out it's actually very difficult discussion for students, and also for teachers. Teachers reported, you know, sometimes, particularly 
when students get into technology like uh, face detection, those technology talking about the bias, kids can get potentially get into emotional and we need prepared teachers really for those kind of discussion. Yeah. Awesome. So we have about uh, seven minutes left. So I want to go ahead and move to uh, our participant um, QA, QA. Dave, I saw there was a question you wanted to answer live. Do you want to share that one? Yeah. So there was a, a question from uh, uh, Kunjay Kim asking if AI could be taught without using any foundations of CS or programming. Um, and I would say absolutely. Um, in fact, the curriculum that we're designing for Georgia, we can't assume that these students um, have prior programming experience. Some do and some don't. And so uh, you, can, you can talk about a lot of topics in AI without getting down to the level of writing code. Uh, but what's really cool is that there are kid-friendly programming frameworks that have AI extensions now. So if your students are familiar with Scratch, or if you're willing to put in a, a day or so, you know, to introduce them to the Scratch interface, you can do things like make a Snapchat face filter or make a little um, conversational agent um, right in Scratch. Um, similarly, uh, MIT App Inventor has AI extensions. Uh, my own uh, AI programming framework called Calypso. Um, the whole thing is an AI programming framework. Um, so there are things that are kid friendly that can be picked up very quickly. So if you want to include some uh, programming aspects, you can. But if not, you can teach a perfectly fine AI course without having the students writing a single line of code. Any other thoughts on that one? Yeah, our curriculum, we assume no programming background of students at all. So all of our curriculum are using hands-on activities, uh, participatory simulations, all this, the, literally this, uh, all, all those kind of unplugged activities to teach AI concept to students. And as David mentioned, we also have an extended activity where students, when they work, use uh, teach Google's Teachable Machine, they can extract uh, um, the trained model and uh, import it into Scratch. This is only for students who have Scratch background. But I totally agree. Kids don't need to know about programming in order to learn AI. So there's a comment in the chat. Uh, Olgan Sadik says, um, teaching AI does not sound possible in the current education system. Um, what do you think the speakers on this panel have been doing for the last several years? Um, I, I, it's not clear to me why you think it's not possible when we're actually doing it. By the way, I, I, I want to share a little bit of thoughts. When I started uh, 10 years ago, uh, I thought, oh, you know what? I, I need to teach all the way the way I learn, right? I learned on the TI-994A, or since we we're in Texas, <laughs> and the ZX Spectrum, and, uh, and you could just type certain commands. So that's why I was pushed very early into Python, okay? And, um, it's a real programming language and it was designed, I mean, the Raspberry Pi platform uh, was designed in the UK to expose. So I want to say that right now they get nothing. So anything you give them is better than nothing. And we also see that all the work that has been done, again, the kids make connections, right? They can go from pencil and paper to to programming and back. Uh, and it, it Again, you can teach computational thinking like the traveling salesperson, as I answered, without even doing any code. And actually, that's a wonderful problem. You have a couple of dots and you want to connect them and you, you measure all the length. And that's a very fundamental concept. However, having said all of this, um, I do want to say that uh, I, I do think it's possible to do authentic experiences with real programming, now with Google Cola, Python, Jupyter, but it will require uh, some effort from the teachers. I have to say that our experience, and I'm sorry repeating here, is that the students can go. The students will kill to go. When we had them program with Raspberry Pi and Linux, we taught them the shutdown command and say, this is how you shut down a bank 
system. And then they were very, very, very motivated to learn about everything that is to shut it down in Linux. You know, so over and over and over again, the kids are, are, are hungry. They really, really want to learn. And anything we throw at them, they, I feel guilty that we are not providing them these opportunities. <laughs> I was curious if some of that might be, you know, systemic, just thinking about the load that, you know, teachers already have, right, and the intentionality um, to be able to build it into professional development, to be able to have time, to be able to go and, and learn some of these things. That's, you know, and that's not, it, there's value being added without giving additional burden, right? And I think that's, 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 a, that's always a big challenge. Um, I know some of the research I've had on K-12 learning analytics is, how do I have time to learn all this, you know, kind of, kind of idea. So, I mean, I think, you know, ways to incentivize that, you know, having administrator buy-in, you know, even policy level too, thinking about that, um, you know, building it into pre-service, um, you know, curriculum teaching at universities too, right? Starting that early on rather, you know, than we, we've talked a lot about in-service here, but too, but thinking about the pre-service and, and the changes that happen. I know Dave, uh, and we're, we're short on time here. I know you've talked uh, government level. Do you have any experience that you can share on that? Well, one thing AIFK12.org did, and this was led by my colleague, Christina Gardner McCune, we held a workshop for state uh, education officials to try and help them plan out how are we going to implement AI into our state education standards for K-12. And so uh, there are multiple states who formed working groups uh, who are working on this. We've held follow-up meetings with them. Uh, we have a report coming out soon on the state of AI education in your state. And yeah, states have to make this a priority and it, it, it is gonna take additional investment um, to provide people the PD and the learning opportunities that they, that they need to get up to speed. It's, it's not something that you can take you know, one hour of PD and feel confident doing this. It's like taking a math teacher and saying, well, now you're gonna teach saxophone. Well, great, right? You know, give me a couple of years and I'll, you know, maybe I'll do that, but I can't do it with an hour of PD. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. So, um, so we're up against time here, but there's some, some great questions and we haven't been able to answer everything, but um, definitely feel free to um, include it in Whova and we can uh, follow up at a later time um, after the session here. So, so definitely please get your questions in there. We'll definitely take a look at those going forward. I just want to thank all my panelists. Um, Y'all were awesome. It was exciting to see your work and I look forward to the future work that you have. Um, and, and for all the participants in the session, please, uh, as they mentioned, please reach out and explore the work further. And thank you for attending today.